Imagine that this lobby is your organization's network. And that network is under attack from nation states, insider threats, and cyber criminals. But what these attackers don't know until it's too late is that you use ExtraHop. With ExtraHop, ransomware attackers don't stand a chance. You've got one hour to comply, or all that precious data will be sold to the highest bidder. I need to get this laptop on your network to someone who works on your network, to someone who works here. What? Neither do software supply chain attackers trying to infiltrate your enterprise. ExtraHop can thwart even the stealthiest nation-state attacks. So, who's your tax guy? ExtraHop is always watching. Anyway, my daughter forgot her phone. Ready to detect any threat. She's on the 18th floor. You can just go right in and slip it in her purse. Wow, this is a really good picture. I think it's derivative. On hour. With ExtraHop, you've got the upper hand, no matter what they try. Think they're buying it? Definitely. Cyber attackers have the advantage. It'll be our little secret. It's time to take it back with security that can't be undermined outsmarted or compromised. Even by the most advanced threats. Extra hub. Security uncompromised. Hello, and thank you for joining me to talk about techniques for stopping ransomware in its mid-game. My name is Chris Thomas. I'm a senior security advisor with Extra Hop. I'd like to introduce you to the idea of the mid-game and what this actually means and how we can use it to our advantage when it comes to finding and stopping attackers on the network. First, some context around ransomware and the metaverse. So far, we don't know of any instances of ransomware being deployed through the metaverse or that being an attack vector, but rest assured, we can be sure that it's gonna happen eventually. And if anything's true in cybersecurity and IT, Whenever there's a new technology, something that kind of distracts us, right? it's very easy to sort of follow that and look for the threats. What we want to do is stay in context of what we're actually doing today within cybersecurity. While we need to be aware of the metaverse and the opportunities that is going to bring new ways for organizations to do business and for customers and partners to interact with us, we still need to have a bit of awareness as to where it's going to fit in our overall threat strategy and not become too distracted by the shiny new technology or continue to play whack-a-mole from a security perspective. Where we always look for new solutions to new threats. We need to look at the threat within the context of what we're already doing within our enterprise security. So when we talk about ransomware, We've seen an evolution of how ransomware has been deployed and how it's affected organizations over the last few iterations. It started off being primarily something that was just a, a spray and pray type approach. It wasn't targeted. It was automated malware that spread and it affected a system and then moved on to the next one. We saw initial access techniques such as phishing emails or stolen credentials. And the target for initial versions of ransomware was simply an individual, not organizations, it was very widespread. And we had quite a small ransom to start with back in 2016. As we saw the evolution, we see change in targeting from spray and pray to more targeted spear phishing attacks, still seeing some automated malware such as WannaCry and other ransomware uh, malware executables running around across the internet and infecting networks. And they're doing things like using that bring your own device or trusted relationships where they're able to spread those viruses and those malware inside an organization quite quickly. But we did see a shift in the targeting to be more around the employees in an organization rather than to the individuals at home and also an increase in the, the average ransom payout of $6,700. Moving to today, we're seeing more of a land and pivot type approach where the techniques being used by ransomware threat actors are very similar to what we've observed for many years with nation state and advanced persistent threat type actors. Very similar in the way they operate. They get into an organization, map out where the sensitive information is, exfiltrate the data that they're interested in and what they call now a, a lock and leak approach where the information gets leaked out and threatened with being uh, leaked onto the dark web. So the second facet of the ransomware isn't just the files that are locked up inside the organization, but the release of the sensitive information out on the dark web is extortion as well. 
And we're seeing remote desktop protocols, initial access brokers being used as well. So initial access broker being someone that is purely tasked with getting access into an organization and selling that access. They don't want to actually run any of the malware campaigns or ransomware campaigns themselves. They just find a way to get into the organization, get that initial access and sell that off. And speculation is how we're going to see the metaverse play in this particular area. If we're going to see it potentially rise as another access mechanism that these threat actors can use to get access into the organization. So that's what we need to watch out for and be aware of, but also not get distracted by that being the only possible way into an organization. We have seen latest ransomware cases, a massive increase for over six, from 6,700 to over $170,000 as an average ransom being paid. But we see that that's only really a small amount of the total cost when it comes to the cost of a ransomware incident. So we see that ransomware being paid and that ransom payout being quite high. But on average, we're seeing that only be around 10% of the actual cost of a ransomware attack, where we start looking at things like the legal fees, and the, the data that's been lost, the downtime, and potential backup and disaster recovery processes, the people that are affected, right? That ransomware payment is only a very, very small amount to that. And we've seen that the prevention only approach hasn't worked. More and more things get deployed to combat specific threats, but once an attacker is motivated, they're gonna find a way into the organization. That's where we need to be able to detect to prevent them carrying out their mission rather than allowing that initial compromise to become a breach. And so to look at this idea of how we can actually model out what an attacker is doing and find different ways to detect them inside the organization is to borrow a bit of an analogy from the chess world. I don't know if everyone's caught up with the latest Netflix sensation, right? the Queen's Gambit, all about the world of chess. Where again, it's very easy to look at a game of chess and be very focused on that initial move, the opening of the game of chess, but then also get distracted by focusing on that, that end game, right? the actual approach of how you're going to take out the king. But in reality, most of the game in the game of chess is focused on the mid game. Right? So once that initial move has been made, what are the maneuverings and the actual tactics to then be able to set up the end game? We can look at an attacker performing a ransomware attack in a similar way in that once they've got initial access into the organization, they're gonna try and carry out their mission and reach their objective of exfiltrating the data for use in the leaking phase of that attack, but also in deploying ransomware to lock and destroy that information as well. But if we focus on just trying to stop them getting into the organization, or we focus on trying to detect the malware when it runs inside the organization, we're missing a big game or missing a big part of where we can actually detect the attacker inside the network. And that's where we come to the mid game. So to use that analogy and look at that from an attacker perspective with ransomware and the modern ransomware kill chain, we look at that opening move or that initial access and we still got those things we need to be concerned about, right? Those different techniques that we saw in the previous slide, the phishing and stolen credentials, Drive-by download still occurs. I worked on a case a number of years ago where the initial access vector for the threat actor was via a fake Google Chrome update that was used to install a remote access tool on a victim's workstation. So we're still seeing that. We still see exposed protocols like remote desktop being exposed to the internet that maybe haven't been secured with multi-factor authentication. These are the different techniques that we're seeing the attackers use to get access into the environment. And we need to make sure that we're aware of the access possibilities via the metaverse as that rises as part of our interaction with our customers and our partners as well. But important not to just get focused on that and distracted by that. If we look at the end game, what the attacker is going to do once they're inside the network, they're gonna find that sensitive information that they're looking for, steal that information, exfiltrate it so that they can hold it for ransom for both being leaked um, on the dark web or on the internet in general, but also find where that sensitive information is so they can delete it and run their ransomware executables to encrypt and destroy that information. But if we just focus on that initial access or that end game, we're missing out on a very large part of what the attacker is doing on the network and many opportunities for us to detect them and stop them before they get to that end game or that extortion cycle. So that's we refer to the mid game, right? Well, as soon as an attacker has got that initial access, they're gonna perform various tasks to be able to 
map out the environment. So enumerating the targets and finding the targets on the network, finding where that sensitive information is, where the file shares are, where the databases are, where the SharePoint server might be, right? wherever that critical information is, they're gonna map it out and find that. They're gonna use domain escalation. They're gonna get administration rights. So we need to be able to monitor things like Active Directory and our authentication systems, where we can spot any anomalous behavior or suspicious activity that may be an attacker trying to escalate their privileges. They're gonna do lateral movement. They're gonna move around inside the network from one host to another. There's no intrusion I've ever worked on where a single host was compromised and that was it. There's always lateral movement to other systems inside the environment as part of this um, mid-game uh, element as well. And then lastly, things like command and control that we can monitor and detect on the network to be able to see when they're trying to pivot, when they're trying to move around and run the commands across the environment. So there's lots of different stages that we have to be able to detect this activity in this mid-game section. And what I love about the mid-game is it actually gives us the ability to thwart the defender's dilemma. If you worked in cybersecurity long enough, you would have heard this phrase, what we call the defender's dilemma, that intrusions are inevitable and defenders have to be right 100% of the time, but attackers only have, to be, only have to be right once. And personally, I really hate this statement. It's such a defeatist statement. It's like, well, why do we even bother then, right? If we have to be right all the time, the attack only has to be right once. But this is only true if you focus all of your detection strategy and your prevention strategy in that prevention only mindset of trying to stop that initial access by leveraging the mid game and understanding the different stages of an attack and the different elements and techniques an attacker is going to use once they're inside the network, we get to actually flip that on its head and we can create what we can call the intruders dilemma. So once the attack is actually inside the network, the network's foreign to them. They don't know where things are. They really, you know, they're foreign to the environment. And in this case, us as the defender, we only need to detect one of the intruder's missteps to be able to start the response and prevent damage. And that's a much more encouraging way to look at things, I think, rather than that old idea of having to be right 100% of the time versus the attacker only right once. Now we can see, well, the attacker needs to be right all the time because if they make a misstep, we can detect them and we can take action. And when it comes to understanding what these techniques are going to be, what are these different things that comprise the mid game? That's where we can see uh, some very good documentation and analysis that's taking place at the moment in the industry with resources such as the DFIR report, right, to fit Digital Forensics and Incident Response Report. So I've linked on the screen there, the DFIR report. There's a great collective of incident response analysts that write up great investigations and great analysis after the intrusions that they have worked on and that they've um, you know, evicted the, the attacker from the network, where we can see all the different techniques that they are looking for and monitoring and that they have seen as part of these attacks. And I have an example here of a case study they did towards the end of last year on a Conti ransomware incident, where we can see from day zero, when the initial access took place, which was a phishing email, using a word macro to get the bizarre loader malware, that initial stage downloader installed into the environment. But we see them move through the next three or four days with all these different techniques that they've used for enumeration, for command and control, for lateral movement and data staging. These are activities that when we know what to look for, we can monitor for those and detect this activity on the network. Right? We see in day two, more lateral movement, more command and control, some more data staging with uh, software being uh, uploaded and installed onto mega.io as an external cloud resource for actually being able to exfiltrate this data. Before day five, we see lateral movement and the actual encryption of the, the malware being run, right? The ransomware itself, Conti, being deployed on day five. So if we're relying on detecting just that end game, just detecting that malware when it gets run, you know, there's five days where we could have actually looked for other activities that would have given us a tip off that this was occurring inside the network and allowed us to stop the activity before the ransomware got deployed. So when it comes to detecting this type of activity, this mid game, as we're calling it, right, the enumerating the targets, the domain escalation, the lateral movement, the best way to do that is from monitoring the network and doing network detection and response. Because the network's uniquely placed in that, as I said before, there's no intrusion where only one system gets compromised. 
So the attacker is going to move across the network from host to host. It gives us the best opportunity to detect that activity. So we're able to provide that information there. And you may have an EDR in place, and EDR is a great tool. I used to work in incident response, and we used to refer to the EDR and the network visibility that we used together as being the two sides of the same coin. But some of the problems with the EDR is you know, the main problem that you see with EDR is actual coverage. Right? There was no environment I ever worked on or any intrusion I worked on where we had 100% coverage with EDR agents. Either there's always a system somewhere like a database or maybe Active Directory, for example, where the resource usage on the system is too high and the administrator just won't let you install another agent on a system. So you have coverage gaps there, as well as just simply systems that can't have an agent installed like IoT devices or other security devices or bring your own devices that may be on a network as well. The third element that rounds out what we often refer to as that SOC visibility triad is the SEAM. Right? And SEAM gives great information. Um, it's able to give us you know, insights into the self-reported logs from the different systems, such as from databases, such as from your firewalls and your IDS. But again, things like a database, you need to turn on trace auditing on the database. And again, most DBAs just won't let you run that level of security because of the potential resource and performance impacts it can have on the actual database system itself. So it's important to have the visibility from the endpoint agent as well as from the SIEM, but it really gets rounded out by being able to see the information from the network perspective as well. Another way of looking at that is you can have a look at so surveillance camera and a high definition view of what's happening across the estate. We can see things like network visibility gives us that view of all the houses on the block and we can see all the communication between the houses and who's communicating to who and what the patterns are for communication. And we can see the you know, surveillance camera out the front of the, out of the house there. If we have EDR, so it gives us great visibility into the actual X-ray vision as to what's happening on a host regarding the actual files that are being accessed, the registry keys that are being manipulated, the processes that are running. But as we said before, may not have 100% coverage that gives us the ability to see inside every house. We only get to see inside every house or every second house inside the environment. So having that combination of that X-ray view of what's happening inside the house, as well as the security camera view of what's happening outside, gives us that best chance to see what's actually occurring and spotting these threats in what we call that mid-game. The scene view is generally pretty blurry because the scene's only as good as the log sources that you have. I've worked on many cases where we're in, you know, following an intruder and the intruder has been able to delete the logs before we've had a chance to collect them with the seam or simply the system wasn't instrumented properly with the seam to give full coverage of all of the logs that you're interested in. Many people will get just the operating system logs, but not get the IIS logs, for example, on a Windows um, web server. Or they may not get for Outlook Web Access, they may miss the IIS server that's sitting at the front of the Exchange server to write in that Outlook Web Access service. So we see these things being missed, even things like remote desktop services. There's a bunch of different logs that you can collect to get visibility into uh, uses of remote desktop services or terminal services. Quite often they aren't being collected in the seam. So we miss out on some instrumentation and doesn't give us the full picture. So the best way to spot these attackers and identify this activity in the mid game is using a combination of these different tools for network visibility, for endpoint visibility, as well as the seam with your logs. And an example of where this has actually taken place, so I've got a two case studies. One was quite uh, famous just over a year ago. We saw the uh, Colonial Pipeline Company was a victim of the dark side ransomware group. And we saw after their initial intrusion, they had attacker behavior that was missed in the mid game, right? That wasn't picked up by their next gen firewall or CASB or IDPS or their NAC solution or DLP. Right? The activity wasn't picked up. We did see the cost of the breach then was over $153 million as they weren't able to determine what the impact of the ransomware was going to be inside their organization, inside their network. So they had to take the action themselves of actually shutting down their pipeline network, even though postmortem showed that the ransomware was only affecting um, their IT systems. But they had to take action. They didn't have the full visibility to know what the attack was going to do. So it had a cost to consumers over $153 million and around five days worth of downtime. And out of that $153 million, 
only about $5 million of that was the actual ransomware payout itself. The rest was those ancillary costs as we covered earlier on. But around the same time, there was another organization that was a uh, victim of the dark side ransomware group. This was a uh, large Canadian retail organization, but they actually using extra hop and able to monitor the network activity so they're alerted to some SMB data staging, so file share access that was suspicious inside the environment. And what they're able to do was actually see that related activity, identify the attacker in that mid game phase before they're able to execute and stopped having an impact on their organization. So they're able to act quickly to quarantine some infected devices that we see the attacker was controlling. They shut down the attack before it could progress. And overall, they had just over a few thousand files out of millions of files were actually exfiltrated and encrypted. And the company was able to operate. They didn't have to shut down and they had no other, they didn't have to pay a ransom, they had no other costs associated. Right? So that's what we're talking about when it comes to understanding and detecting attackers within that mid game phase. You can have a real benefit to stop them getting to their objectives. So this is a little bit about Reveal X360, so extra hop produce this uh, this this, company, uh, this product will reveal x360 which is our hybrid solution for providing complete visibility across your hybrid cloud enterprise you simply need to deploy a sensor in the different locations where your workloads exist so on your on premise for example in your data center with very high uh, high speed workloads we have sensors that can run there as well as inside multi cloud environments so inside aws inside azure inside Google Cloud, as well as being able to monitor SaaS uh, solutions as well, for being able to pull in logs, from example, from Microsoft 365 for complete visibility there. And with the Extra Hop solution, when you deploy Reveal X360, no matter how many sensors you need or where they get deployed across these different uh, workloads, they're all visible and monitored from a central location through the cloud control plane, which gives us that central visibility no matter where those workloads exist. We're able to perform federated machine learning as well. So all the metrics being generated by all of the sensors are fed into our cloud scale machine learning services, where we literally run over millions of models against the different entities and the metrics that are collected from within the network. That gives us a very high fidelity for detections with a very low false positive rate. We're also able to provide a record store for our uh, transaction record lookbacks, up to 90 days worth of lookback of being able to search through network transaction information. And this is really useful for threat hunting, for example, you've got a hypothesis that you want to test and look for any particular service or look for a user account that may have been misused over a period of time. But also if there's a new IOC or a new attack campaign that gets uncovered, you've got 90 days worth of historical lookback where you can look um, back in time for any historical compromise. Right? So very useful function there as well. So that's a little bit about extra hop and reveal X360. What I'd like to give you just to end the presentation today is a call to action to really be prepared. Right? Don't get distracted by shiny new things, new technologies, new capabilities. Yes, they're going to be opportunities. Yes, there are going to be risks, but at the end of the day, we've still got the same core requirement to secure our information and whether that's a threat that's going to come via the metaverse or come from traditional access, right, we still need to be prepared and still monitor for that. So the main thing is to understand the adversary and be prepared for what their actions are going to be in the mid game. And as I said, the DFIR report is a great resource for understanding these attacks and understanding the techniques that these attackers are going to use. Why it's unique is it's focused on the techniques rather than, you know, this is the MD5 hash of Mimikatz that was used, or here's the IP address that was used for command and control, because those things change for every intrusion, even when it's the same threat actor group. But the techniques remain the same. So understand the techniques that these attackers are going to use and understand how you would detect them inside your environment. Right? So great to be able to map those out and make the intruder's dilemma their reality, right? Make it difficult for them, once they're inside the network, make it difficult for them to maneuver around without you know, tripping an alert and being able to be monitored. So make, make sure that you know, the intruder is foreign to the environment and the defender, that's us, right? We really need to def detect one of their missteps to start the response and prevent, and prevent the damage. Thank you very much for your time. And I Hope to speak to you again soon.